This is our presentation on our UK and Greenland mining assets. It's a presentation we released in August 2020. Some updates will be uh, necessary, but I'll talk those through as we go along. This is our disclaimer. We uh, don't obviously make a recommendation regarding any decision to sell or buy shares in Alba. There are some forward-looking statements and uh, many factors could cause actual results to differ materially from anticipated results. Alba's board and management. Well, we've got a very experienced board, um, many decades of experience in mining. Uh, Alba was set up as a mining company on AIM in 2005-06. Um, we've just brought on Mark Austin, who's a very senior geologist and a huge amount of gold experience in particular, which is invaluable for our work at Cogai. We're unusual in having both mining assets and oil and gas investments. We have looked for, over the last four or five years, assets that are undervalued, have got previous production history, such as Clog Eye St. David's in Wales, such as the Amitsok graphite mine in southern Greenland. We also look for very high grade projects, uh, such as the Tule Black Sands Ilmenite project in northern Greenland. And um, we're looking, as I said, for production, such as at Horse Hill on the oil side. Our share price has um, risen uh, substantially since this was pr produced. So we're now running at around 0.25 of a P on uh, the 16th of September. This is where our projects are located. So there is um, some sort of, uh, if you like, some sense to uh, our portfolio in terms of geography. We've got Greenland assets, and we've got a cluster of assets in the UK so and, the, and Ireland. So the Southern Greenland asset there, you can see and the tip of Southern Greenland is Amitsok. It's on the same latitude as far Northern Scotland, Shetland Isles. So um, it's actually quite a permanent uh, uh, climate for operating there. Uh, Northwest Greenland, you'll see a cluster of three projects we have up there, which is Tule Black Sands, our Ilmenite project, Melville Bay Iron, and Inglefield Land, which is a polymetallic project. And then looking down at the UK and Ireland, of course, going from left to right, Ireland is our Limerick Base Metals project. And in the UK, we have the Clog Ice and David's Gold Mine and our oil and gas investments in Surrey in the World Basin. We'll talk first about Clog Eye. It's the largest historic gold producer in the UK, 80,000 ounces recorded. But it's never had proper modern exploration attributed or, or, or used there. Uh, no historic exploration drilling, no joined up regional exploration. So we've gone in there with our team to sort of try to do things in a professional and methodical manner. So we've extensively rehabilitated the mine. We have identified several targets within the mine, looking for extensions to the uh, existing or worked, pre previously worked gold veins. And then we've gone further afield and looked at the regional gold targets um, over the Dolgethlai gold belt. And, and we've unearthed several um, new gold targets, which we will come to. So in a sense, you should think of Clog Eye really as two projects interlinked. One is the Clog Eye gold mine, where we're trying to restart production there. And the other is this gold exploration project over the Dolgethlai gold belt, which is, which, you know, is, is several miles long and where we've done a significant amount of work, but there's still a lot of uh, prospectivity over the gold belt. Dolgethlai is, um, is the nearest town to our project. We're in uh, North Wales, uh, we're close to major roads close to the coast, close to the port. Um, so it's very well located. Those areas in blue there are our, our license. The, one of the great things about Clog Eye is that there's a huge amount of underground development already in place, which would cost millions to replicate if we were to do it from scratch today. You can see in this diagram, the areas in red are the pre-1900 uh, mining areas. In blue is the post-1900 mining areas, and then the green areas of sort of post-1980, more the more recent development. 
Um, we've got several targets within the footprint of the existing mine and the beauty of having this underground development on several levels, as you can see, is that we can get in and get close to those targets for some quite short holes to be drilled and to take some bulk samples. Um, since Mark Austin, our senior geologist, came in uh, to our team, uh, he and his, his team have been doing uh, a lot of work on updating our 3D geological model. Very important, this work, so that we can understand the deposit and then really sort of hone in on some of these targets. So you'll see here a snapshot of that 3D model. In the middle is the existing mine development in the yellow, the yellow lines. Um, and you can see there the blue is the base of the clog ice shale. And really that's where we're interested. The primary mineralization is found where the quartz vein uh, contacts with the base of the clog ice shale. So uh, that's uh, why that is important. And you can see a fork running across the diagram, which effectively intersects and displaces the uh, mineralization between the clog eye mine and, and the St. David's mine is why we call it the Clogo St. David's Mine. It's actually two mine areas. So our plans, it says here plans, this was in August, and we've actually started, as we've announced, we have started drilling uh, underground at Clogai. So these targets in, in white, these white arrows, we are successively ticking them off, and um, we'll announce the results at the end of the programme once we've been able to assay the drill core. Um, but the plan is to drill up to 1,400 metres. Um, the first phase this month won't be anything like as many metres as that, but we will go back in uh, when we're next able to, to, to finish that programme. Um, the, short, the short holes of 50, 60 metres, and as I say, that's because you're able to access the targets far more closely and closer to them from underground. We're also at the same time doing bulk sampling. So we've got one team doing drilling and another team doing bulk sampling. And these um, grey ovals are some of the locations we'd like to take bulk samples from. Why bulk samples? Because this is a, a regularly, irregularly disseminated gold project. So the mineralization isn't homogenous in one uh, deposit where we can just drill in various places and we know we're going to hit it. It is irregularly are distributed. So it's important that as well as drilling, where you're drilling for structure essentially, you also look to drill, uh, sorry, to bulk sample. So you take out several tons of material and process that to see whether you're in the right place. So the two go hand in hand, the drilling and the bulk sampling, which is why we are doing exactly that. We'll be looking to take anything from 25 to 30 tonnes, depending on the time uh, available and how quickly we uh, were able to do this bulk sampling work. Another good thing about clog eye is that the processing is very simple. Now, this is a simplified flow sheet that you can see where we take the ore that we um, take out in a bulk sample, for instance, put it through a primary and a secondary crusher, put it through a simple concentrator over a sluice box, over a shaking table, and uh, produce a concentrate. Now that is a very simple, simple um, processing flow sheet. And the reason why it can be is because our gold clog eye is what we call free gold. It's not associated or bound up in other minerals which would make it uh, more difficult to extract. So simple crushing and concentrating exercise. So that, um, that's really good. Obviously we have some of this um, plant on site, but the first type bulk sample, we're likely to send it down to a third party processing facility in the UK. Thereafter, we'd look to complete this circuit essentially and have our own pilot plant established so that we can do about three tonnes an hour uh, of all, uh, put, it, put, put that amount of material through it uh, and do it ourselves. It's more efficient and certainly more cost effective to do that. And then we'd look to obviously scale up that pilot plant once we get into commercial production. Mm -hmm. Talking commercial production, uh, another reason why clog eye is so interesting uh, from a mining perspective is that clog eye gold fetches a significant premium over normal spot rate of gold. So until recently, the gold price was uh, up at historic highs of $2,000 an ounce. Uh, we would say conservatively that we should be able to fetch at least a two to three times premium 
and probably more than that. Obviously, it depends on the amount of gold that uh, we're able to push into the market and, and how we go about that. So but it's a good, very good starting point. It helps our economics uh, significantly that we can uh, attribute a, a significant premium to clog eye gold. Now, people often ask, why is that? Is it a different type of gold to anything else? Any other kind of gold found in the world? No, it isn't. It's the same as any other kind of gold. But it's scarce. Uh, it has a heritage value, so it's um, very sought after by um, obviously very proud Welsh people who like to have uh, Welsh gold, in particular clog eye gold uh, jewellery. And it also has a royal cachet, so the royal family, the British royal family, have been using clog eye gold in particular for their wedding rings for the last hundred years or so since uh, Queen Victoria. So all the way through to Princess Diana and um, Princess uh, Catherine and even Meghan uh, more, most recently. So uh, it has that cachet. And uh, so we see this market really being a potential joint venture or offtake with a luxury brand, um, but also production of gold coins and small gold bars for investment purposes. Uh, we think those are the most likely routes for uh, commercialization. Gold prices said until recently, this needs updating a little bit. It's come off a little bit since these highs, but it is still very high. And the gold price um, certainly touched £2,000 an ounce, uh, $2, sorry, an ounce um, a couple of uh, months ago. So um, it's very healthy. As you can see, when we bought into Clog Eye, it was a, the gold price was a lot lower at $1,200 um, an ounce. So this, as I said, really helps our economics and, and helps in terms of when we start to put together a feasibility study, once we know where our gold is located, um, we'll get a better idea of how much gold and at what grade we need for this to become a profitable operation. So um, the price of gold certainly helps significantly. As I said, we're also in the uh, regional exploration business. So at Clog Eye, it's not just about the old mine and bringing that back into operation. It's about this gold belt, most of which is under license to Alba. So we're in a very privileged position to have um, almost an entire gold belt under license to one company being ourselves. You can see here crisscrossing across this gold belt. Um, we have run uh, many, many lines of soil sampling over about a 12-month period. And these are the grades that we were getting. So the darker the blob, the better the grade. And this is just gold in soil anomalism. So we're not expecting high grade in soil. We're just wanting to see that there is gold above the detection limit. Because that gives us an idea that there may well be a gold deposit beneath the soil in the hard rock. And that's the method uh, that we've employed. And as a result, and we've only covered about nine kilometers so far, we, um, as I said, a, there's a lot more that we can be doing on this, but we've already unearthed 10, in 10 separate gold targets. As you can see in that inset map, the, the gold um, ovals, they're all new targets, not associated with any significant prior mining period. So pretty exciting to have unearthed these targets. What we want to do with them is to go in and take some, uh, to dig some trenches. And exactly as it sounds, very simple process. We use an excavator to dig uh, these trenches. This is the first um, target that we're going to do. We've got planning permission for this now. So the area that's ringed in red, we will be taking out uh, the soil, the topsoil, uh, exposing the bedrock. That's probably only about half to a metre uh, deep um, before, by the time we hit the bedrock. So it's a fairly simple exercise. We expose the bedrock, we map it, we sample it, we send the samples obviously to a lab for assaying to see what, um, what we find. If that comes up with gold actually in the hard rock, then the next thing obviously will take further samples and ultimately to go and drill that target to see if we can unearth another clog eye. And that's obviously the name of the game here. We're looking for another a virgin gold deposit that's never been worked before. There's a lot more trenching that we'll do in future campaigns. But as I said, we're just starting with this one area here that, uh, that we should be able to start um, this, this side of, uh, uh, of 
of 2020 rather than uh, next year. Next year, we'll move on to other targets. So that's our timetable, if you like. It's very indicative at this stage. Obviously, we're in the middle of this drilling underground and bulk sampling. We're going to be establishing a pilot plant, as I mentioned, and we're going to be starting the trench high priority gold targets over the gold belt. Then looking about a year to three years out, we'd be looking to write up a PA, preliminary, preliminary economic assessment or a P pre feasibility study to show that the economics um, of the mine stack up for production. Then we'd submit a full scale planning application. The, the mine previously did have planning. Um, so we are confident that we will get uh, planning approval again to reopen the mine. Um, then we'd look to these offtake agreements potentially with jewellery brand, brands or others um, for the marketing of our gold. Um, we'd upgrade our pilot plant into larger long-term processing facilities and we'd start commercial production. So that was um, Clogo in a, in a uh, nutshell, if you like. And um, if we can move on to Greenland, it's important to talk about uh, what we've done there because we moved into Greenland about five years ago with uh, an investment in the Amitsot graphite mine and project. And since then, we've operated very happily and well in Greenland. It's a very um, mature uh, and mining friendly jurisdiction. And we've put on, um, we've added three other projects since Amitsok in Greenland. So we've got a concentration of some very high quality assets in, in that country. And it is a country which has got significant mineral wealth and some very big deposits. So um, a snapshot here of what we're doing in Greenland. You can see the, uh, someone, one of our geologists holding some mineral sand from Tule black sands. That stuff is, that's why we call it black sand. As you can see, this is the really high grade stuff that you just pick up from surface as you walk on the, on the active beaches, just as you'd walk on the beaches in, uh, in Cornwall. So it's uh, very easy mining um, and very high grade ilmenite. But other than that project, we've got a cluster of projects up there, Melville Bay Iron Ore, which we'll touch on and we've also got the, uh, the Inglefield multi-element project. Why um, in these particular commodities? Well, I'm sure you know that graphite is uh, greatly in demand. It's always been uh, used in industrial uh, purposes, for industrial purposes, but now and of late, it's been a very important component in a lithium ion battery. It is the anode material uh, for a lithium ion battery. So the electric vehicle sector, which is exploding, um, in the right way, um, figuratively speaking, is um, you know hugely reliant upon flake graphite, and that's the graphite we've got at Amitsok. Iron ore has come back recently. The price uh, has been depressed for some years, but of late, it's and we'll touch on this has come back quite significantly. So, Melville Bay beauty of this project uh, was that it was drilled by somebody else, and they spent millions doing it and getting a joint resource. We've picked this project up. And, um, and you'll see that it's got uh, real potential. And uh, we've already touched on the Ilmenite. You can see there these very big um, uh, hills of, uh, of mineralization in the, in the inset uh, photo there for Tule Black Sands. And the importance of Ilmenite is that it is the, uh, it's basically contains titanium dioxide, which is the principal feedstock for, for pigment production for paints and coatings and plastics. It's a whitening pigment, so it's a massive, massive industry and uh, hugely in demand. This is where Tule Black Sands is. We are on the same coastline as the Blue Jay Mining uh, deposit at Dundas. They worked their deposit for several years before we got involved with ours and picked up our part of the license. It is the same mineralization on the same coastline, very similar uh, uh, fundamentals in terms of the grade um, and the fact that you've got higher grade in the active beaches, you've got slightly lower grade, but still good grade in the um, raised terraces behind the active beaches. And um, as I say, a very similar profile. They've got a much bigger resource than we do. We've only drilled for one season. So we, we would look to drill um, another, at least another season to increase our resource at uh, TBS. It's very, uh, for, for Northwest Greenland, is actually well located. I mean, we've got a population which we've used for workforce, K-12 
Kanak. We've got the airport at Kanak. There's actually a US Air Force base at uh, Thule, um, very close by, and we've got multiple bays on our license, which would be very useful for um, sheltering our infrastructure jetties and, and, and so on. As I said, we drilled uh, the first season and we uh, drilled extensively up and down the, our coastline, about 10 kilometers, and we came up with a jolt resource straight away, which was uh, just indicative of how uh, easy, if you like, this project is to explore. Uh, so we've got a 19 million ton resource, which translates into about 1.7 million tons of contained ilmenite. Now, that, if that were to be translated into reserves, then that would mean a life of mine of more than 12 years for a one and a half million ton per annum, per annum operation. So already we've got a significant life of mine there if, that, if we can convert those resources into reserves. And as I said, we've got plans to drill deeper past the permafrost to increase this uh, resource significantly. We move on to Amidsoc, which we've touched on. It's a very high grade graphite in southern Greenland. It was a mine um, in the turn of the 1900s, or it was about 1920 actually. Um, some very small scale mining uh, went on there. Didn't have anything like the demand for graphite that you see today. And um, it's very well located in terms of its climate. It's in ice free waters. Um, we have done a lot of test work on Amitsot. We've done several field seasons there. The graphite is averaging about 28% at the Amitsot deposit and 25% at the Kalak deposit, which is a completely new discovery that we made that wasn't known before. So we've got two deposits essentially, as you can see in the inset map, um, two separate deposits where the Amitsot graphite mine is, there's one deposit and across the water there on our mainland portion of our license, you have the Kalak graphite discovery. This is a nice um, bar chart because we're the, we're the one on the end in red, uh, Amitsok. These are the grades of other significant graphite deposits around the world. And our average graphite grade, far as I know, um, is still um, the highest um, of any deposit uh, in the world. Now, some of these projects are obviously a bit more advanced than us or a lot more advanced than us, but none, notwithstanding that, our grade is a huge hugely important factor of course is very high so it uh, really does help us a lot again with economics to have high grade material to to be working with and because we've done so much test work metallurgical test work we know that we can get a marketable grade concentrate of 97.3 percent uh, carbon out of amitsot graphite we've got high recoveries and we've got a third of our flake in the premium value large to super jumbo flake category. So um, that might sound a little bit odd, but basically uh, large to super jumbo flake is um, used in industrial processes and it does attract a significant premium. So that helps us a lot with, again, the economics of making this a commercial proposition. The graphite that you use in electric vehicles is, tends to be small to medium flake, and we've got plenty of that as well. Uh, it doesn't fetch a premium, but the, the demand for that graphite is, uh, is increasing exponentially. So we have essentially all the major markets for graphite covered within, within our flake uh, size distribution. Our plan at Amidsoc is to drill. We know there's a lot of graphite there, but we need to prove it up. So we need a jolt resource. So the plan is to drill at Amidsoc. We were intending to do it this year. We had to put our plans on hold because of coronavirus. Essentially, Greenland was shut down for several months for, for foreign visitors. So there was no prospect of getting a um, drilling, drilling team into Amidsoc. But uh, we revisit that next year and, and drill that. And certainly you intend to drill that deposit uh, starting at Amitsoc, uh, if there's time, we would also drill at Kalak. But we, we think that within with a modest uh, program of 10 or 12 holds, we've got a very good chance of getting a maiden jolt resource there. And I think that can then push Amitsoc firmly into the development phase uh, because it is a former mine, a bit like Cogai. So um, we know that it can be, uh, can be mined as it has been mined. 
Uh, last one I want to touch on is Melba Bay and all. I mean, probably has been sort of fourth or fifth tier, uh, maybe even sixth tier project for Alba over the last few years. We just haven't been able to devote time to it. It is, however, a very, uh, very interesting and prospective deposit. In fact, it could well be several deposits. You can see there where we are. We've got three sub areas under license to ourselves, and they're all they're all targets, and they're all iron, and they've all been drilled, in fact, and there's been iron uh, found in all locations. Uh, the beauty of this project is that there is a jolt resource on it already of 67 million tonnes at 31.4% uh, iron. Um, the real interest here and why previous operators have gone in here looking for iron ore is that if you look at this geological map, you'll see across the bay in white there, you'll see Marvel Bay in red, with a red dot and across the Baffin Bay, uh, you move into Northern Canada and that is the Mary River iron ore deposit there and also in a red dot. Now you can see that the committee belt, which is a geological formation known, um, uh, historically known and mapped, um, moves from Northern Canada into uh, Northern Greenland and that's why the hypothesis is that Mary River, which is a very high grade DSO, direct shipping ore deposit, um, the hypothesis is that Melville Bay and around there should also contain high grade deposit, uh, uh, deposits of iron ore. A lot of work's been done, as I said, at Melville Bay. Um, uh, test work has shown that this material, though it grades 31% average, uh, in the resource, it beneficiates um, with conventional magnetic separation up to 70%. So 70% is a high-grade magnetite concentrate, which is highly uh, saleable. And as you can see there, we've also established that the, uh, ele the other elements are, uh, are, are low. So it's a high-grade, low um, contaminate, contaminant project. The... Mary River Iron Ore deposit, as I mentioned, is hugely yeah, significant. It's a massive, in fact, it's nine uh, separate deposits. They're only mining currently from one, but they are mining 4 million tonnes per annum, as far as I know, from 2017 until today, every year. And they ship that um, high-grade ore to Germany, um, UK and Japan. In the background there, you'll see the Mary River jetty, at the Mil Milne in Inlet port, uh, loading a ship for the European markets and inset further uh, to the right, uh, top right, you see the mine itself. So it's a significant operation. It shows what can be done, albeit that you're in Northwest, Green uh, Northwest Canada in this case, or Northwest Greenland in Melville Bay's case, um, that you can have these significant operations. But uh, certainly the high grade element makes this a, a, a massively uh, profitable proposition. Iron ore prices recovered, as I've mentioned, greatly in the last uh, recent years. And when this graph was produced at uh, touching $100 a ton, um, which, uh, as I say, is a significant recovery from its lower $40 in, at the end of 2015. Why are we interested uh, to push Melville Bay forward? Well, yes, it's got a resource, which is great, and someone else has drilled that. So we take the benefit of that, but we think there's significant potential to find that high-grade DSO material. And some of the drilling has already shown that potential. So um, there has been 69% FE found in an outcrop at Hematite and Nunatak and Dodovis Fjord. And uh, drilling at Hematite and Nunatak came up with um, half a metre or 0.6 of a metre at 68.3% FE, so it's very high-grade. The beauty of the high grade stuff is that it needs very simple uh, crushing essentially and then putting on a ship loader to, um, to go to European markets and Far Eastern markets and it doesn't need any further processing than that. The cost implications are uh, that you can keep costs very low, uh, proportionally very low. So that's Greenland in a nutshell, a bit of a race through, but you know, I hope I've shown that we've got some really good assets, really strong assets in Greenland. We want to get back in when we can next year and drill that maiden resource at Amitsop. We certainly want to be looking at commissioning uh, some economic assessment of Melville Bay and getting in there and trying to target Melville Bay drilling for some of that high grade material. 
Um, we want to go in and increase our drill resource at Tule Black Sands. And that, again, is a simple proposition of drilling beneath the permafrost to increase our tons uh, and our resource tons. And, um, and then we're looking for, at that point, we'd be looking for offtake partners, probably for Amitsok and Tule Black Sands. And we haven't even had a chance to touch on the, uh, the huge potential there is up at Inglefield land. So that's um, Alba's mining uh, assets uh, in a snapshot, if you like. Um, there's a lot more information on our website and on our Twitter page at Alba Minerals. Um, we're also on Vox Markets. So please do follow us. Thanks very much.